Welcome back, everybody. Our next guest delivered news to Canadians for well over five decades after retiring from the anchor chair in 2016, where he helmed that for over three decades. He has conducted thousands of interviews, and he is now releasing his latest book entitled Extraordinary Canadians, Stories from the Heart of our nation. He shines the spotlight on a selection of people changing this country for the better. It is our pleasure to welcome Peter Mansbridge, author Peter Mansbridge, to our show today. Welcome to The Social. Hey, thanks so much, Melissa. It's great to be talking with both of you today. Peter, we're delighted to have you. And you, throughout your long and vibrant career, interviewed countless people, every, from everyone from former President Barack Obama to uh, the Dalai Lama and, you know, countless others. Uh, but for this particular book, you chose to focus on 17 Canadians, uh, most of whom likely many of us hadn't heard of before. So how did you go about choosing and why did you go about choosing this group? Well, it's funny, you know, people ask me, as I'm sure they ask both of you, you know, who who's your favorite interview of all the people you've talked to, all those celebrities and famous people you've talked to? Who's the most the one that you enjoy doing the most? Well, for me, when I answer that question, it is it's not those famous people. It's not the celebrities. It's often the people who I hadn't heard of before and many people I hadn't heard of before who I find tell the most extraordinary stories. So that was kind of the premise of, at least for part of this book, is to find those people that many Canadians didn't know about, hadn't heard of before, uh, but have been doing extraordinary things. Well, we're all wearing our poppies, and as we commemorate Remembrance Day, uh, one of the Canadians that you profile in this book is a commando in Joint Task Force 2. That is a special operations unit of the Canadian Armed Forces. And readers get an unprecedented glimpse inside a capture-and-kill mission in Afghanistan, and it sounds like you tried to get access like this for decades. So what does this finally mean to you, Peter, to to finally be able to tell this story? Uh, I did work for almost 20 years in trying to get access inside JTF2. They are very, as I said, secretive. They're very close-handed in terms of what they talk about. Uh, but finally, after all these years, um, they agreed to give me some sense of what it was like. And it is quite something, I think, for a lot of Canadians to read, to understand some of the, what was going on in Afghanistan. We remember the Afghanistan war from the tragic number of Canadians who lost their lives, most of them in roadside bombs. This mission is about trying to capture or kill the bomb makers. And uh, it, 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 it reads like a movie. It's quite something. I mean, all of the stories in this book are incredibly fascinating, but you say that there are two particular stories of uh, two Indigenous women, um, General Surgeon Nadine Karen and child welfare activist Cindy Blackstock, that really struck you the most. Uh, why is that? Well, these two stories particularly grabbed me. I started my career in northern Manitoba. I did a lot of stories that reflected the kind of difficulties between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Canadians. Now, in these two cases, in Cindy Blackstock, who is a little bit known in terms of the country because she has been an extremely um, dedicated activist on issues that reflect uh, the difference for uh, Indigenous children and non-Indigenous children and the kind of benefits they have. She's worked very hard at that, but her, her own background is extremely interesting. She comes from a mixed home, uh, and, you know, an Indigenous father, a non-Indigenous mother. So she was having this struggle within her own life of trying to determine who she was and who she who she wanted to be. Nadine Caron is a doctor in Prince George, British Columbia, and uh, she was the first female Indigenous surgeon in Canada. She also has had incidents in her life, uh, in particular, that dealt with the issue of racism. And uh, there's a story to tell in her story, and uh, I think it will influence anyone who reads it. You know, this book, you really do consider heavily what does it mean to be Canadian? And for so long, people have said it's so ambiguous. It's very hard to nail down. Um, do you believe that we are any closer to, I guess, defining what it is, what it means to be Canadian? You know, it's funny, Melissa, throughout my career, I've had this question in front of me, especially in all the, the years covering various constitutional matters in Canada. Uh, it always came down to this, what is a Canadian? And we'd come up with great answers like, 
Well, being a Canadian is not being an American. Well, really, I think people are looking for something more than that <laughs> as an answer. So um, I, I think I'm closer to it in, in trying to understand. And a, a book like this has helped me because what it says to me and what a lot of my travels have said to me over the years is that Canadians are, 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 are a special breed. We're kind of a special brand. We care about others. Now, lots of people care about others, but we do it in so many different ways and we show it in so many different ways. And I think that shines through in certain elements of this story as well, this this book and all the different stories we tell of the 17 people we profile. Peter, you know, you are such a trusted news source and have been for, for years. And right now we're living in a time where disinformation and fake news are, are ever present and becoming increasingly dangerous. So what do you think needs to be done in this realm in order to maybe gain back the public's trust from a media perspective? Right. Trust is a trust is a huge issue uh, for the media. You know, they do these trust barometers every year for different professions. And journalism always used to be quite high on that trust barometer. It's slipped considerably uh, in the last 10, 15 years. So what do we have to do? What do we need to do? I think we have to be much more transparent in how we tell our stories. Uh, you know, it was interesting a couple of weeks ago in the days leading up to the American election, I found that many of the American news organizations recognized the fact that there was a trust element. And one of the trust areas for them would be how to report the election results. And so they went to a lot of trouble in the days leading up to the election of explaining exactly how they made decisions, exactly where they got the results from, how they tabulated them, how they made decisions about uh, you know, who was ahead, who was behind, uh, and who eventually would win in particular states. So I think that's the kind of thing we have to do much more of. We have to be much more transparent in the way we operate and the way we connect with our, in our case in television, with viewers. Mm -hmm. Peter, I have to ask, as somebody who, you know, was so beloved as a news anchor for so many years, and you covered everything from 9-11 to the financial recession and everything in between, how do you feel right now at this moment in, in life when there is so much happening? Um, do, you, do you wish you were behind the desk again? Do you ever miss it? <laughs> well, I, I think anybody who grew up in journalism... Um, would say, listen, what you live for is the big story and the big moment. Uh, and this is the big moment. This is a big story. This is one of the biggest stories, if not the biggest story of, of our lives. So part of you is saying, I wish I was involved at the level that I used to be involved in terms of journalism. But there are other things to do to contribute at a time like this. And I've been trying to do that, uh, not only you know in charitable ways, but also uh, in a kind of journalism way. I've been doing a daily podcast in, in, in my little office here in Stratford, Ontario, which has very much been a hobby. But uh, when I look at the uh, newscasts of today, and whether I'm watching Lisa or whether I'm watching the 112 people who took my job at the CBC, just just kidding. Uh, <laughs> when I do watch those programs and Donna on Global, all of them, I am amazed at how solid the journalism is. Um, we can always pick away at certain elements of, uh, of, of the way uh, journalism is today, but overall confronted with this enormous challenge that uh, all networks and all news organizations on different platforms have been faced with. Uh, I, you know, I, I have nothing but uh, uh, respect for those who uh, are of the generation that followed mine and followed Lloyd's and are, are, are doing their thing in, in a very responsible way. Extraordinary Times. Uh, we want to remind our viewers, your new book is entitled Extraordinary Canadians. It is available now. Please go out and get yourself a copy. Again, uh, to the extraordinary Peter Mansbridge, thank you so much for joining us today. Listen, thank you, uh, Cynthia and Melissa. Thank you very much. Very kind of you to mention my book today. Thank you. We'll be right back right after this.